This is RTV6 News at 5, working for you. Good evening, I'm Amanda Starantino. And I'm Mark Mullins. First at 5, sorting out the confusion. Many people say they don't know whether they can even boat on Eagle Creek Reservoir anymore. Well, some boaters tell us the city of Indianapolis is interpreting a decades-old rule differently now. And on top of all of this, those people say they could be out of a lot of money. Our working for you, RTV6's Cameron Riddle takes the issue to the city and is getting answers tonight. 90 degrees, clear skies, light winds. Not a bad day to take your boat out on the water. But here at Eagle Creek, several boats are sitting dry after boaters say park rangers said they couldn't bring their big boat motors in the water. Boaters tell RTV6 for several decades, they've been allowed to take their boats with large motors of more than 10 horsepower into Eagle Creek Reservoir as long as they didn't turn them on and instead used a smaller, less powerful motor while on the water. That rule is on the books and is posted around the waterway, but Brian Waldman, a longtime fisherman, says the way that rule is being interpreted has recently changed, possibly due to boats with large engines taking advantage and going too fast. Now that rule is keeping his boat out of the water. They would not allow me on the lake Thursday. The park rangers said if I put on the lake, they would arrest me and confiscate my boat and trailer. Late this afternoon, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources sent RTV6 a statement saying if boats aren't in the water, it could impact the revenue generated from fishing licenses. DNR says, quote, it will be taking a look at how this issue impacts anglers' ability to utilize the reservoir. So what is the actual rule? RTV6 has made several attempts to get clarity from the city of Indianapolis, but so far, we've only been told they're looking into the matter. At Eagle Creek, Cameron Riddle, RTV6. Well, late this afternoon, Indy Parks responded to RTV6's questions and why they didn't address the direct concerns of the boaters that called us for help. They did send a statement highlighting the city ordinance 341-204, which bans boats equipped with engines larger than 10 horsepower from entering Eagle Creek. In part, the statement says, in recent years, Indy Parks has worked with park visitors to make sure the ordinance guidelines are not only being followed, but also to ensure that we answer questions about speed limits on the reservoir. You can read that full statement on the IndyChannel.com and on the RTV6 app. Amanda. And tonight, Mark, health officials are urging you to take extra precautions this year to protect yourself after mosquitoes in two Indiana counties have already tested positive for West Nile virus. The Indiana State Department of Health says mosquitoes in Elkhart and Clark counties have tested positive for the virus as of today. Indiana health officials have not found any human cases of West Nile virus so far in 2019. However, the health department expects increased West Nile activity throughout the state as this season continues. So working for you with what you need to know to avoid those mosquitoes, do not stay outdoors long when mosquitoes are active, which is late afternoon, dusk to dawn, and early morning. Apply an EPA registered insect repellent containing DEET, cover exposed skin by wearing a hat, long sleeves, and long pants in places where mosquitoes are especially active, such as wooded areas. Install or repair screens on windows and doors to keep those mosquitoes out of the home. Well, this stretch of hot and stuffy weather continues with high temperatures around 90 degrees once again. I'm with Storm Team 6 meteorologist Kyle Mounts in the RTV6 Tracking Center. And so I think a lot of people want to know, are we going to be getting some relief from this heat soon now that we're in the yeah. 90s? Yeah, because now we're three for three. We made it to 90 degrees again in Indianapolis this afternoon. And really not any rain out there to cool us down. Let's take you outside, show you that temperature on the thermometer. It's 89, but as you saw just a moment ago, it feels like we're in the middle 90s because of that dew point. It's in the lower 70s. Anytime we get there, that's that real tropical stuff, kind of that air you can wear with that west breeze trying to help us out a little bit between 10 and 15 miles per hour. Not going to get a whole lot of relief here, though. Even through 10 o'clock, temperatures are going to be in the 80s, dipping down into the lower 70s overnight tonight. Satellite and radar, we did have a couple of ice isolated downpours over the western portion of the state at this point just left over with some clouds and think that any isolated rain chance we have that is quickly going to come to an end so maybe you've got some of that yard
hard work to do here once the sun goes down. You're in good shape today and for much of Tuesday before those rain chances go up. We'll detail that in a few minutes. See you soon, Kyle. Thank you. The city of Indianapolis just finished fixing and improving sidewalks that were crumbling in one neighborhood. Now people who live in that area of the city say the city already wants to tear out those sidewalks to complete an even larger project, leaving many upset. Working for URTV 6's Stephanie Wade finds out what's going on and what's it going to cost taxpayers. Despite a city councilor and everyone who lives along Johnson Road who this would impact opposing this project, DPW is still moving forward with plans to take out this sidewalk that was recently upgraded a few years ago and replace it with a 10 foot wide path. So the sidewalks go away? Straight, sidewalks are gone. And how do you feel about that? I, I think it's a waste of money. <laughs> They're good sidewalks. People use them every day. Only a few years ago were the sidewalks updated along Johnson Road on the northeast side and ADA accessible curbs installed. But now the city wants to tear those up to make way for the new Johnson Road Trail. This trail would connect the 71st Street Trail and the Fall Creek Greenway and create a safer protected lane for bikers. But neighbors who have signed this petition say it's not necessary and the area doesn't call for it. It's a waste of taxpayer money, and there's better places to spend it. They have potholes on Johnson Road. Why not fix those before this project? You know, fixing chuck holes comes out of our road budget. This project's local match does not come out of our road budget. So if this project wasn't happening, the dollars used for the match of federal money would actually not impact the road at all. Coming up at 6, hear from the director of the Department of Public Works and where he says the money for this trail is actually coming from. Stephanie Wade, RTV6. Thank you, Stephanie. Democracy 2020 coverage. South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg will bring his presidential campaign to Indianapolis later this month. Today, the Young Democrats of America announced that Buttigieg will be the keynote speaker when they hold their national convention in Indianapolis. The mayor is scheduled to speak on the second night of that convention, which is Thursday night, July 18th. It will be his first campaign appearance in his home state since he gave a foreign policy speech in Bloomington almost a month ago. And more on Buttigieg tonight. His campaign says he raised nearly $25 million in the second quarter, tripling what he received in the first three months of this year. The Democratic presidential candidate says that 400,000 different donors gave that estimated $25 million. Buttigieg surprised many people with a first quarter haul of roughly $7 million that topped many of his better known rivals and helped place him in the top tier of a crowded 2020 field. Meantime, the money is mounting in Governor Eric Holcomb's campaign bank account. He's expected to announce the launch of his re-election bid in less than two weeks. Holcomb's campaign says it collected $1 million at a fundraising event this past week and received a $1 million transfer from Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch's campaign account. At the end of 2018, Holcomb's campaign had about $4 million in the bank. He scheduled an announcement event for July 13th. And today we've learned the man who runs Indianapolis's First Church of Cannabis also wants to run the state. Bill Levin said today that he will seek the Libertarian Party's nomination for governor. The First Church of Cannabis recently celebrated its fourth anniversary. The members still can't legally use marijuana in their church, but Levin says he plans on making legalization the main part of his platform. The Libertarian Party holds its convention next spring for the 2020 election. The director of Indiana's Department of Child Services is responding to a class action lawsuit filed by a group of foster children with disabilities. Call 6 Investigates was the first to report that story last week. In the suit, the children claim the state fails to protect its most vulnerable children. Today, DCS Director Terry Stigden calls the lawsuit misleading and puzzling. Stigden points to the number of improvements the agency has made, including more manageable caseloads for family case managers. Stigden points out despite a 20% increase in calls to the child abuse and neglect hotline since 2015, the agency answers calls within 15 seconds on average. New at 5, one of Indy Park's outdoor pools will remain closed for the season because of a major maintenance issue. Indy Park says while trying to fill the outdoor pool at Craner Park, they were unable to avoid potential damage, which led to flooding of their indoor pool in the family center. To avoid having to close both pools, Indy Parks has decided to close the outdoor pool for the summer. The Craner indoor pool is still open.
Still ahead of 5.30 on RTV6. As we get older, it's important to stay in shape, but some gyms are now targeting a much younger crowd. We'll show you why and the possible benefits for your kids. And up next, we said goodbye to a train service route between Indianapolis and Chicago over the weekend. But tonight, another company is picking up the slack for travelers trying to get to the Windy City. And we're in a hot bubble of air right now, and it's going to be a few days before it bursts. But I'll let you know when we'll get in on some cooler temperatures. You're watching RTV6 News at 5. Now before July 4th fireworks. Welcome back to RTV6 News at 5. The urgent search continues for a 12-year-old retired Marion County Sheriff K-9 who has been missing for several days after being frightened by fireworks and escaping from her enclosure. The Marion County Sheriff's Office says Leica disappeared from Canby last week. The former narcotics K-9 is not a bite dog and is very friendly, according to a Facebook post from the Sheriff's Office. Leica has leg issues and is microchipped. She is a Belgian Malinois dog, so if you have any information Call authorities at 317-327-3811. A new bus service is available starting today for people looking to travel between Indianapolis and Chicago. The service is a direct response to the end of the Hoosier State Amtrak passenger train route that ran four days a week. The Hoosier State passenger train ended yesterday due to a lack of funding. Amtrak does run another route between Indianapolis and Chicago, their Cardinal route. It's part of their Chicago to New York City route and runs three days a week. The bus company, Our Bus, is hoping to help bridge the gap in transportation. There are other busing options to and from Chicago through Greyhound and Megabus. But what makes this company different is that they are higher end and they actually work with local companies to provide these buses. They also provide stops needed by crowdsourcing. Riders can request stops they believe should be along this route. The route is based off uh, customer feedback we received. Okay. Uh, so the, the train has stops for a lot of smaller towns that uh, are off the highway. It's not practical to serve them all, so instead what we want to do is hear from people where they want the bus to stop. The company has already received enough requests that the bus will have a stop in Zionsville. They will add more stops as requests come in. Our bus is offering $10 rides for the first two weeks of service. This is meant to help gauge the need and interest the new busing option between the two cities. It's summer and we're spending a lot of time in the sun. So tonight our Scripps team is working for you, finding out if your sunscreen is safe. The FDA is asking major players in the industry to go back to the lab and get more data on some of the ingredients that go into skin saving creams. Of the 16 active ingredients currently marketed in sunscreen, only two have generally been recognized as safe and effective. That's zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Two more have been found unsafe and are not on shelves in the US. And the FDA issued a proposal back in February to get more data on the other 12 ingredients, but doctors say there's no cause for alarm. Dermatologist Dr. Jennifer Lucas says people should worry less about the individual ingredients in their sunscreen and focus on the bigger picture. A couple rules of thumb for you are, number one, it should have at least a 30 SPF. Number two, it should say broad spectrum. If you're gonna be out swimming, sweating, doing things where it might be washed off of your skin, you'd like it to be water resistant. And what you think is too much may not be enough. Lucas says you should use a shot glass or a golf ball sized amount for your entire body and make sure to rub it in completely into the skin for about 30 minutes before you go outside and reapply every two hours. Well, temperatures across central Indiana, as you see here, have been at or near 90 degrees over the past week. And today is another hot one. So that means you're probably blasting the air conditioning in the car. But there's one button you may not know how to use in these temperatures, and that button has an arrow turning around inside the car. You see it here. So it's called the recirculation button and it plays an important role in the heat. According to World Class Auto Service, the button is mainly used for the summertime. It helps keep your cool, uh, get your car rather as cool as possible when you have the AC on. It recirculates the cool air that you get from the AC when you first turn it on. The longer it's on, the cooler your car gets until it's as cool as it can be. If you don't use it, the car will use that air from the outside that is a lot warmer and your AC will work harder to continuously cool the hot air from the outside. Lesson learned here today, right? I love those little lessons. It's always those things that you think 
everybody knows exactly yeah. what it does, but but they no don't, one really right? Does. Exactly. But no one's like uh, wants to raise their hand and say, "What's that for?" What exactly? Used it today. Good for you. Um, because it's one hot. thing to keep in mind, it is hot, right. and those cars, once they're closed, it can get triple digits with heat mm -hmm. like this within about ten Easily, minutes. Easily, right? So what they say too: look before you lock, right? Mm -hmm. And you leave your car. All right, let's take you outside and show you where the temperatures sit right now. Ooh, it is Stevie in Kokomo. You're at 92. It's 89 in Indianapolis, Bloomington, lower 80s. And that's because you had some rain that moved through earlier this afternoon. That wind out of the west and northwest right now, about 5 to 15 miles per hour. Big picture shows we've got a few thunderstorms down along the Ohio River, but otherwise things are pretty quiet out there this evening and just that isolated rain chance. So maybe you're going to be waiting a little bit here as the sun starts to go down to head out on that walk. Boogie, though. Here and comfortable on the kitchen counter, so may not be uh, ready for that walk just yet. But as we go through this evening, those temperatures, as mentioned, are going to stay warm. We're still in the 80s right through 10 o'clock tonight. And overnight, yeah, we're going to find many of those locations around 70 degrees as you start off your Tuesday morning. And this is a forecast that probably looks pretty familiar. It looks a lot like today's forecast as we're going to start off with those temperatures in the 70s. We're already into the middle 80s by 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. And then as we get into the afternoon and evening temperatures close to 90 degrees isolated chance for a shower or storm i think the rain chances may be a little bit higher as we go into tomorrow afternoon so that's where we'll pick up with truecast 130 tomorrow things are nice and quiet for us as we get into the evening though you start to see a few more of those showers and storms firing up especially along and south of interstate 70 here and as we go into the evening hours those will move through pretty quickly but could have some heavy rainfall and some frequent lightning in a couple of those storms so we'll track that for you 90 degrees in bloomington 93 tomorrow in muncie so where you don't have a downpour to cool you down it's still going to be on the hot side and that heat index for the lunch hour in the middle 90s so probably a day for for having the lunch indoors and at times that heat index will be close to 100 degrees. Seven day planning forecast now and as we get closer to the 4th of July the rain chances do start to increase a little bit here not considering it a washout but we may need to kind of adjust our plans and certainly keep an eye on the sky here as we'll have more showers and storms around but that does bring our temperatures down a little bit. Highs are into the middle 80s by the upcoming weekend. And 90s tomorrow though. Still yeah we got a couple of more of those. Yeah. I was yeah. out of town for the last couple of days Days and I got off the airplane this morning and you could just feel the like humidity. Right, yeah. oh, I was like, I'm back. Welcome home. Right. <laughs> well, only on our TV six, get ready. The drama is going to get turned up on a few notches on tonight's episode of The Bachelorette. I mean, when is it not? Hannah is growing more frustrated in her search for a life partner as she has very confusing feelings about Luke. She can't decide if she's falling in love with him or if he's just driving her crazy. Meanwhile, she has several other suitors that she's shown serious interest Interesting. And to make matters worse tonight, apparently tension levels will rise. You are the fakest person I've ever met. You don't even know me. Oh, I know you. I've been nothing but truthful with Hannah. You are not going to mess it up. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> okay. We will see how this tense situation unfolds and how much more clarity Hannah gains this evening. I love all that editing. The Bachelorette begins at 8 p.m. only on our TV sticks. We're rooting for you, Hannah. Right. It's supposed to be fun, I thought. Okay. <laughs> Take a look at your screen right now. Do you know what this is? What is this? Well, if you do, you aren't going to believe this next story. It shows that time really does fly. Working for you. A man found guilty of first-degree murder in the death of a nanny is now fighting for his life. A jury is trying to decide whether or not he will face the death penalty. Ted Rollins with our Court TV team is following several new developments tonight. Good afternoon, I'm Ted Rowland. Scott Edward Nelson has been found guilty of first degree murder for the killing of Jennifer Lynn Fulford. Now, his life hangs in the balance. And the same jury that convicted him must decide whether to recommend the death penalty or life without parole. Nelson took the stand in his own defense last week. Now the question is, will we hear more from Nelson during the penalty phase? It took the jury four hours to hand down a guilty verdict. This is a jury that is not afraid to ask questions, by the way. There were questions during deliberations and already this morning, we've had more. They're asking the judge for instructions to be number. They want an overhead projector and air conditioning uh, turned up in the jury room. And then 
A bombshell. Juror 272 made allegations against another juror, 218, saying that that juror told other jurors that he could not vote for the death penalty. He was ultimately dismissed from the jury after a stern admonition from the judge not to talk to the other jurors as he packed his stuff and got out. This case has a lot of drama. The penalty phase just starting. Uh, both sides had very compelling opening statements. The prosecution started laying out a case that Scott Nelson should be put to death. Will Nelson take the stand and ask the jury to spare his own life? We'll have it all for you as we continue gavel to gavel coverage of this very compelling case right here on Court TV. I'm Ted Rollins, now back to you in the studio. Ted, thank you. You can watch every development in this high profile case 24 hours a day on CourtTV.com. So sometimes there's a moment that reminds you how quickly time passes. Well, that's just a nice way of saying it makes you feel old, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly 40 years ago today, 40, Sony released the Walkman. It was the company's first portable cassette player. I had one or two or I several. I had a few. In 1979, the Walkman sold for $150. Wow. And it became a smash hit. Sony sold 50,000 Walkman devices in two months. The Walkman became a precursor for how we listen to music today. It inspired portable CD players and eventually iPods, which led to listening to music straight on your phone there. But that's where it all started. That's awesome. On the go. Fun to see. Yeah. All new at 6 p.m. here on RTV6, a new law takes effect to protect your child's lungs. The Call 6 investigation that prompted the change in state law and what you can do as a parent. But first on the Now Indy, it's July 1st, and that means a whole bunch of new laws are now in effect. We'll show you the notable changes and what you have to know moving forward. You're watching RTV6. We'll be right back with the Now Indy.